Okay, so once you hit your checkpoint, uh, you've got into the shape of your life, there's two choices you can take. You can either just focus purely on building the perfect lifestyle solution for you, where you find your sweet spot and then learn how to stay in the shape of your life for life. Or you take uh, the other end of the spectrum uh, where you actively gain body weight in a controlled fashion in order to pursue more muscle, uh, muscle gain. Now, those are like the two ends of the spectrum. And of course, it runs, it runs on a spectrum. So you can, you know, you can either just focus completely on staying the same body weight, or you can go up in a very slow way, or you can be more aggressive with it. Now, there's multiple ways to do it. What we want to talk about today is why for most people, they shouldn't embrace the fluff. And for most people, they're probably better off just learning how to stay linear around, or at the very, uh, the very most, pursuing slow, very slow muscle growth and, and very slow building, because what we want to talk about today is what it actually takes to embrace the fluff and what a productive investment phase where you are focused on embracing the fluff actually looks like and, and what the realities that go behind it are. Because it's not a case of just let's just gain some body weight and embrace the fact that we'll have a little bit higher body fat. It come, it gets it runs a little bit deeper because your whole lifestyle has to be is different to someone who's um, simply pursuing a, a lifestyle solution. So uh, yeah, let's discuss... Um, Let's discuss this and, and maybe start off with what are the realities of embracing the fluff actually look like? So I'd say if you're going to make muscle gain at an optimal rate, a high priority for you, then your training is going to have to be a really high priority for you. So not only in terms of getting your sessions in, but then when you're in the sessions, really making the most of it. Uh, and this is something which I think can be hard for a lot of people to get their head around initially because Whereas you can think about just ticking the boxes of your nutrition, I'm ticking the box of my sleep, my water target steps, whatever it is. This is something that you just can't just tick a box with. Just going to the gym doesn't mean you can tick the box. Yeah, you've ticked that you've, you've gone and done the session, but how you actually act within that session um, is going to dictate your progress to such a large degree. That means one, the massive part is just going to be a form, whether you are using good form, but then also matching that with really high levels of effort as well. And I think, when we look at most people in a gym, um, effort and form are, are things that hold them back. And so if you then go into a surplus where you are gaining weight on a fairly consistent basis, driving body weight up, unless you're providing the stimulus to build muscle, your weight will keep going up, but it's just going to be from body fat. Now we know by embracing the fluff, your body fat is going to accumulate, but you want to have the best ratio of muscle to body fat to make that actually uh, worthwhile doing. If you don't provide that stimulus in those sessions, all you're doing is just getting fatter at a controlled rate, basically. Yeah, I think people have really misconstrued what embracing the fluff means. They think, oh, fantastic. If I just, now for me to put on a ton of muscle, that just means I need to get fat and you know not, nothing else really matters. So yeah, embrace the fluff. See your abs, this and that. But uh, yeah, what you just said is absolutely true there. You need to provide a stimulus to the body for it to for it to grow you know and embracing the fluff should be a byproduct of you performing in the gym and then yeah executing effectively making sure your form and technique and most importantly i would say effort effort and form are always going to go hand in hand there but if those two if those things aren't there and, and yeah as you said that's not a tick box you can't just go oh yeah tick that that um that is a huge huge variable that a lot of people seem to miss when it comes to what it actually takes to embrace the fluff or what it, what it means in, in the context of what we're speaking about here. I think that there needs to be a, it's almost a sense of you need to earn the right to embrace the fluff. And this is why uh, perfecting training intensity during your process phase can be really useful because that way if you're training hard right from the beginning and you learn how to train hard because training hard is a learned endeavor. Once you, if you keep ratcheting up the, the intensity, by the time you reach your investment phase, you can, in some circumstances, go straight into that. But if you haven't had to train hard yet, or you haven't been prioritizing or valuing your training yet, just, just saying to yourself, okay, I'm going to gain body weight, but not matching the intensity at the same time, you, you'll just end up spinning your wheels and not actually getting to, to where you want to get to. It's funny, we have a, a Friday leg session. Um, with I have a Friday leg session with two training partners. And the biggest thing we always talk about if we ever have a new training partner is their own, is their training intensity. And we always say we can gauge how good their muscle body potential is with just how hard they train. And one thing we'll always do is sort of give them a rite of passage um, by, you know, 
throwing f- force reps, drop sets, all, all sorts of intensity techniques, just to it, just to uh, expose someone to their to in- to the the concept of intensity. I remember when I I didn't I didn't because I'm sure you all had your sort of experiences like that as well. But I remember about seven eight years ago, I had my own sort of right passage where someone's putting me through like all these intensity techniques and like you know pushing me to way beyond failure and whatever I thought was possible. And it's almost like you have to go there. To then know what you need to do on a week to week basis. You don't need to do that every single week, but once you get there, then you can just go, all right, I'm going to take 5% off that and just stay there all the time. And I think everyone listening can benefit from, even if you just literally just take a, take a mate with yourself to the gym, go on a machine, like a leg press or a hack squat or something, which is leg, leg based, because I think the intensity can be taught best on that. And just say to the, to your friend, just push me until I can't, I can't even move. And I think you'll just, you'll learn, and so long as the form is, is good, by the way, <laughs> you don't want to get injured, which is something I have done as well. Like I remember I, I pushed myself on the leg press and I said, look, I said to my two training partners at the time, don't let me get off here. Don't let me get off until I hit 25 reps. And I think rep like 16 onwards, my back was coming off the thing. My glutes were coming off the thing. Not, not surprising. That was what led to my, um, my disc issues. So you have to do it properly. <laughs> uh, a hack squat is actually, extensions. Yeah. <laughs> Not leg extension. <laughs> in fact, leg extension is actually probably a good one because yeah. you, you have you such a burn yeah, in there, I mean. right? Yeah. There's so yeah, much yeah, burn yeah. in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think it's a really useful thing. Like, take a mate with you, go to the gym, and just say, "Look, let's not get off on until I physically can't move this muscle." Male or female, like no matter who you are, I think it's one of the best experiences you can teach yourself because then you understand what the barometer of intensity is, and then if you can apply that every time on your own. You can apply a calorie surplus and then you will be able to embrace the fluff. But otherwise, I think most people were better off just learning how to stay lean because ultimately that's what people want, right? They want to stay lean. They want, they want to be in shape. They want to feel fit. They want to have the energy, the vitality. They're not too bothered if, if they gain two to 10 pounds more muscle, right? And the reality is muscle building is going to take two to three years. So you've also got to ask yourself, am I ready to commit the next two to three years to building substantial muscle? And then after another two, three years, you have to do that cycle again. And it's, it's understanding, are you ready to commit the next two to five years building the physique you want? For most people, the answer is probably no. Um, and that's completely fine. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's a lot of value in just learning how to stay lean um, and finding something you enjoy doing active-wise. And a big part of that is also just going to be how you look and feel during that time. Uh, some people will, will love feeling a bit bigger. And if you're performing well in the gym, that may give you a massive buzz and, you know, just seeing your logbook progress. And that's a massive kind of sense of accomplishment. The truth is for most people, when you're embracing the fluff, you know, you've, you've got more fluff when you've got more body fat, you're not going to like your appearance as much as when you're leaner for most people. So it also means that for a period, you're not going to look, look as, you know, in your, in your eyes, likely as, as good as you, you were before. Now that's not right or wrong or anything. And it's a means to an end, but, as well as getting excited about this this muscle that you're going to achieve you have to realize that during that process you might not like how you look as much you you, you know you're going to be a little bit fluffier potentially you're going to feel slightly different clothes might be some clothes might be slightly tighter depending on how long you've been lifting and how big or small you are potentially you might not even look like you, you might not even look that athletic you know if you're someone who hasn't really trained much naturally hasn't got much muscle you've got lean so you've got some good definition now but then you gain a little bit of body fat. If you're like a 50, 55 kilo person, gain a bit of body fat, that's suddenly going to make more of a difference than if someone who's 80 kilos gains a few, gains a few kilos of body fat. So potentially you're not going to look like this, this jacked lifter who's just bulking. You're going to look like just an average person until you then strip off the body fat again. Wow. Um, and maybe that's not something you want to do. It's not, I don't think it just applies to 55 kilos because when I was 90 kilos, I remember I was, pers- I was a personal trainer in the gym. And someone said to me, someone else's client in the gym said to me, said to him, does, uh, does Akash still train? And I was literally sitting there thinking, <laughs> I'm like, I'm, this is the hardest I've trained. This is the most consistent I've been in a surplus, but I just looked like I didn't train. And because I had that, like, you know, a little bit of, you know, just look fluffy, especially because, you know, I started taking progress pictures and stuff like that. It was just, yeah, it's not a good look, but you've got to be think, okay with that. Exactly. And that's what I mean. I think you need to be able to look at the long game and if that is what you truly want then you understand that that is a big investment you know three you know i would say more than two three years if you yeah, really yeah. wanted to maximize that muscle building effort i, I think you're just saying that to make people go oh, okay that's not too long but realistically you know well, it's about three cycles could, of two to three years isn't it 
<laughs> okay, that's better. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So, and, but but again, if you're happy to, um, if if you're happy to accept that, that you're not going to look your leanest, which is still going to be good. You know, it's not going to be like you're going to look overweight. You know mm. what I mean? When you, especially if you've cut down from a position that you were before, relative to how lean you got, yes, maybe, but relative to where you started, you're still going to be in a much better spot if you dedicate yourself to a good couple of years of lifting. So I think that's also important to to consider. But, and at the end of the day, it is all going to come down to how you feel about that. Like if some, when someone said that to you, AV, you could have either been very upset or offended by it, or you could have just been like, well, I know what I'm doing and this is what, how, this is what it takes to get to where I want to go. Cause I know that when I cut it back down, I, I'm going to look, you know, I'm, your 70 kilo shredded probably looks bigger than your 90 kilo, yeah. you know, weight in photos. Right. But you obviously, yeah. you know, that's not true. So you know yourself, okay, all I've got to, when I, when I cut back down, I know that I'm going to be able to reveal something great. So yeah. you've got to be able to see that later down the line. Well, we had someone uh, the other day saying to me, um, you know, they, they used to be, you know, very overweight. They, gay, they got lean and now they want to build muscle. But the conversation keeps occurring is, oh, I'm feeling too fluffy. I don't like how my hips are, my lower back is. I want to get this tighter. And you know, initially the conversation was around, okay, well, this is just part of the process, but now it's shifted to, well, actually, okay, let's just start, let's just get you a little bit leaner and just grow from that point and just accept if you ever hit the, a top end range, let's, let's just put some numbers there. If you're leaner, say you're 68 and you're feeling uncomfortable at 75, 76, let's just grow slowly around 70, 72 and to accept that it will be a little bit slower, but you'll feel happier in that process. And there's a lot yeah. to be said for that because that confidence then you'll feel of just feeling good will cascading in the areas of your life but also just into the process itself rather than feeling like you're just you're just getting fat you'll feel you'll feel yeah. good and by default probably be more um adherent and enjoy the process as well so there's a lot to be said yeah. for if you if you reach a tipping point where yes you are getting stronger because each body weight range until a certain point will give you more strength but you don't like how you feel or look just pull it back to one and just be okay with that and just stay in that zone and then and then grow from there. So that's another thing I people tune into. I think that's a fantastic option for many people. Yeah. Because you can sort of get the best of both worlds there. Yes, you're you're sort of you're you can call it what like gain taining, main gaining, whatever you want to call it, right? Where you're oh, slowly that. trying to get stronger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're trying to get you're trying to get bigger over time, but you're it's it may not take you if you're not dedicating, say, yeah, two to three years of a hard sort of muscle gaining weight gaining period this now may take you say five or six years where you never go on like a drastic cut you never do anything crazy you just gradually build up mm. over time and you just enjoy that you enjoy the process you enjoy lifting you enjoy eating um, a good amount of food but you also feel comfortable in your own skin i think that's really important if you don't feel comfortable in your own skin or if you don't feel comfortable even even if you logically know i'm doing this because later down the line i'm going to look hopefully better yeah <laughs> when i cut back down it's it still can play in your mind you know and if you're but if you're comfortable staying a little bit leaner accepting slower rates of progress over the course of years i think that's a fantastic approach for many in all honesty yeah uh, what do yeah. you guys what do you reckon Ned? yeah it's that's the that's the approach i take with majority of, of clients who, who have muscle building interests um and especially, you know, most people who come to us come into us initially in a position of not liking how they look. Mm -hmm. They get to a position of the liking how they look. And now it's like, all right, well, I'll consolidate for a couple of months. And then they, well, I'm going to push back up to yeah. a body of fat percentage that I'm, I don't like how I look again. Um, mm -hmm. But then I think also it just comes down to, to that balance they want. And it's not necessarily you have to embrace the fluff to build muscle. And if you don't do that, then you can't build any muscle. It's just accepting the rate that you want to go at. If you want to go at 100 miles an hour, you're going to have to go all in. If you want to go, if you're happy with 50 miles an hour, then you can, you know, you can enjoy a bit more of a potential balance. And I think it's also really important to come back to what we said about training initially, it's just identifying what your limiting factors are. If your limiting factor to build muscle is getting enough calories in, having body weight up and to a point where you can progress lifts at an optimal rate, yeah, embracing the fluff is going to be very beneficial. If your limiting factor though, is getting all your gym sessions in your quality of your training um your sleep all of these things then there's, there's no need to to push calories up anymore or push body weight up anymore because that's not what's holding you back mm. and you know like we said if if you're new to training it's going to take a while to be able to earn the right to do it so um potentially you can start with this slower 
um, kind of progression. And then over time, maybe you're in a better position to do it. But I think from a practical point of view, it can be really good to get out of that checkpoint, consolidate and get to a body weight where you're happy with your lifestyle balance. You can train hard. You're not got loads of food focus um, and you're in a sustainable place. From there, you can eat, potentially push up a little bit more to a point where you're at the top end of where you're happy with. Then just hold it. Focus on progressing your lifts. Over three to six months, you're probably going to look a lot better at that same weight. So say it's 70 kilos. In six months, you'll be in a better looking 70 kilos. Or you may even find that your weight starts to just drop down slightly. You probably start you know, recomping or main gaining or whatever. You know, the um, the thing is. Um, <laughs> gain, gain. Gain, gain. Um, and then potentially <laughs> you can just hold within a range. And let's say you're, you, you like to sit between 70 and 71. Every time you see on the scale, it goes under 70, add 100 calories. And then you can just keep holding in that. And you can end up just progressing over time. It's way slower, but you look good the whole time, at least mm. within that, that range. You can still progress it. You know, you haven't got people asking you if you still train or not, but you are still making progress. Um, and for most people, that, that's way the balance of the whole, the whole picture is, is way more appealing. I think if we look at sort of the average person um, who who wants to be a high performer in their work, in their relationships, in their career, et cetera. That's all they need. They don't need to be embracing the fluff. If, if that's not, if the muscle building is not a super high goal. The other thing, I think you made a really good point around psychology in that if you've come from a lot of weight loss, the idea of embracing fluff is going to be very difficult. Even if you know you're doing it in a controlled way, it's probably not the best thing to do from a, from a mental perspective. The other thing to consider, I think, is also is age in that, if you're in your 40s and your 50s, is it really the best time to be embracing your fluff? Like, is it, do you really want to be gaining weight um, outside of a sort of a health, not necessarily healthy, but out sort of a place where you're not like in, in a good sweet spot? Because this is when, this is the age really where you want to be staying lean around just to keep, keep health markers at bay. Um, and I'd say if you are embracing the fluff in your 40s, you probably want to keep an eye on health markers and, and your fitness and general sort of cardiovascular health a lot more so i think age is another thing to consider and that's why if you're if you're starting this journey young which you know, you're, most people are probably going to be starting this journey in their 30s and 40s if you are starting this journey young you've got a lot, you've got a lot more room to grow into but i think embracing the fluff in your sort of early mid late 40s is probably and i don't know it's probably not the best thing to do from a health perspective 100 percent agree with that and yeah you've got to realize that your hormones at that time as well everything is sort of working against you at that point to sort of get the benefits from a dirty bulk or, or you know, whatever you want to call it, embracing the flop, right? There's just, it's the, 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 the payoff is not worth the, the effort that goes into that. Right. And you're at that age, you are definitely better off just, yeah, looking, trying to stay lean, definitely look at gaining over time and yeah, that, that'll be one area that that'll be one place I would never recommend anyone to sort of, get overly fat because it's going to be much harder for you to get that off as well as you as you get older too and yeah, you you're want also to, creating new fat cells which is not cool <laughs> yeah you want to optimize your hormones at that age and just and just yeah don't, don't want to risk anything from a health point of view the other thing just that you touched on is all right are you willing to go to the next level and i think let's say someone is embraced the fluff they've done it really well they've done it a couple of years like there's going to be a point where you have to invest even more to get results um for example, someone asked me like, why no, do you, would you, why did you not? So when I, when I competed in, in 2017, I got invited to the nationals um, to, to, to compete on the national stage. And then but I remember at the time, I, I didn't want to go to the nationals because I thought I don't want to stay lean for that long. I, I would have to have stayed lean for another eight to 10 weeks. I thought that's just not worth the, the trade off on my life. Cause I'm not, I don't want to, I don't have ambitions to be a, a championship bodybuilder or whatever. But I remember all the guys who were around that time in the, in the natural circuit. And I look at them now and I think some of them have kind of just done what I've done and just sort of maintain where they're at roughly just in, enjoying sort of a slow build approach. Some people have just gone to that next level and I'm like, wow, this is, they've made serious, imp impressive physique gains, even when they probably were close, closest to their max potential. And I think that's, that's like, you've got to then invest another level to get to the next level. And this is where, again, like you've got to understand where your limit is. Like for example, for me, I'm not willing now to do another phase where, you know, I'm pushing the envelope with body weight. I'm much, my priorities are much more towards performance than it is to, 
a cognitive performance than it is on a body and physical performance. And because of that, I don't want to go to that next level of, of body composition. But if I had say bodyboarding ambitions, then I would accept, okay, I need to push my body weight higher potentially, or I need to be in periods of embracing the fluff more so I can activate more strength gains so I can get to that next level. I think it's also understanding when you're okay to say no, when you want to just uh, hold it where it is. And I'm sure you guys have had sort of similar experiences, whether you're, I know Ivor, you've definitely had that, right? Um, Ed, I don't know where you are on that spectrum yet. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's just understanding what you're willing to put in and then make sure your expectations are in line with that. Um, and even as simple as, I, I haven't had a coach for a while, but when I, when I signed up to the last coach I worked with, I just said to him, like, these are kind of a few limits that I've got. And one of them was a simple, like one of them was like, I'm not going to take drugs. But another one was even just like, um, I can train this many times a week, but like, I don't want to train on a Sunday just because the gym opens later. So it ends up impacting family day kind of stuff like that. And that might sound silly, but it's like, these are all little things that we've got in life with like, I'm not willing to do a split that means I have to train on a Sunday. I'm not willing to do this, to do that. And once you understand what you're willing to do and what you're not, just then align that with your expectations. Because if you find I'm only willing to train twice a week, I'm only willing to track food Monday to Friday, I'm only willing to, um, I want to be drinking three times a week, whatever it is. And then your expectations are, I want to build muscle at an optimal rate. That is never going to add up. And so embracing the fluff would be stupid for you. But it's just like, just figure out what you're willing to do, match that to, to make sure your expectations are in line. And, you know, you might not make progress as much as, you know, I'd love to make optimal progress in the world, but if I'm not willing to say drugs, that's, that's going to put some limiter on it. Um, well, I think what's interesting there is like when it comes to muscle building, you almost have to be, I think anyway, you have to be more optimal than when you just want to maintain. When you just want to maintain, you can get away with a lot of stuff so long as your calories are in check. Mm -hmm. Whereas with muscle building, you have to be much more precise with regards to like protein timing, with regards to like just uh, your sleep schedule, your uh, lifestyle. Are you going to be going to bars or whatever? Like, are you going to have a few drinks? Um, your training performance, like everything just matters a lot more. And obviously like it depends what level you want to take it to. But I, I think you, things have to be a lot more optimal because you really have to feel performance and you really have to get stronger and so many more things matter. And I think there's definitely a point of diminishing returns where people can be so anal and paralysis by analysis and they, they lose their life just to build muscle. And I think that's probably the wrong way. And that's probably going to have a negative impact on you. But I'd say there is a lot to be said for trying to optimize variables if you do want to maximize your performance and maximize your muscle building. And again, it just comes down to like where you're happy to draw the line. That's a great point. That's a very good, yeah, because when you think about it, you know, you know yeah, if you're, if you're maintaining or even if you're a fat loss phase, you can, you can get by with just obviously nailing your calories and making sure everything is set for the day. But with, with training to, to grow, like every session matters, you know, every session, has value meaning that if you mess something up or if you don't time your sleep properly or whatever whatever the factors that can impact your performance that is going to impact your session and that in and of itself can be a huge stressor to you you know especially if you don't know how to handle those situations effectively because yeah what happens is you get so caught up in just trying to build muscle or just focusing on that that everything else in your life goes by the wayside which is that we've all been there we've all yeah. done that right and I couldn't imagine doing that or thinking thinking about training in that way with everything that's going on in our lives now. It's just yeah. not feasible. <laughs> well, funny enough, like once you do hit the optimal bits, if you overly stress, you actually, I think in my experience, I found I make less progress because I'm just, I'm, I'm too stressed out. Like I, I'm, I have all this intangible stress on training and nutrition that's probably impeding my gains. Whereas if I go with the flow a bit more, so long as I'm hitting some core on negotiables, then, then everything's fine. And, and progress actually seems to come in, in massive spurts. Yeah. I think you have to have a good solid baseline standards for that to work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you need to be hitting your training. You need to be hitting a protein target, roughly calories. But like once you've got that solid foundation, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. The other thing on muscle building, and I'm, I'll probably mention this because I've, um, just with my own training right now is I know I'm sitting around like 77, 77.5 kilos and I've noticed trying to get any more strength gains at this body weight, just like, it's just coming so slowly and I'm like probably mass to sign up. But I know when I was 78 to 79.5, I was getting stronger consistently each week. As soon as I dropped in 77s, I'm literally just fighting to maintain every week. And there's like this constant trade-off I have in my head. It's like, I like how I feel with this body weight, 
But at the same time, it's getting quite frustrating just sort of fighting to maintain every week. It's like, what, what's more important at the moment? And I'm still like, oh, should I just go up a bit to, to, to facilitate more strength gains? Or am I like happy with just turning up and, and doing that? And I think that's another thing where people should can, can need to get their head around as well because progress won't always come every week when, you're, when you are going on a slow build approach. Mm. And something we hear a lot of is like, I've hit a plateau, what should I do? And I was telling, um, I was telling one of my training partners about this and, and he was like, if you look at our logs in the last sort of eight to 12 weeks, most weeks we're just doing the same way and we just try and do it better. And we just try and make it feel better. And it might be like one rep every few weeks, but I think that's another thing people battle with, especially if they take the slow broad approach, because you have to be okay with strength progression coming relatively slowly if you max out a certain body weight. Mm. Mm. But I think in those situations, it's also important to understand that there's so much more to training than just the logbook. You know, there's so much more to just to just seeing progress every week, you know. And, and the, I, I'm, I'm assuming that when you did see that rep or two increase after a couple of weeks, you were like, yes, yeah. got it, you know. And it's an amazing feeling, right? But I think it's, it's important in those situations to, yeah, to look at all the other benefits that training is giving you. It's making you perform at a higher level. It's giving you structure to your day. It's allowing you to see your mates. You know, like all these positive things that come from hard training or just training in general without having to put excessive pressure on yourself to see those numbers go up. If, if you make that, if you make what everything I just mentioned, the, the focus of your, of your training sessions, I think by default, your numbers will start to eventually go up because you're not stressing so hard about them. You know, you're just letting them happen when they happen because you're enjoying the process of just training. Yeah. But I think that's, that's very important that a lot of people miss. Yeah, because your gains, when you do go on a slow build approach, the gains will come slower. So that's why you got to really love, you got to love that, um, the, the process of it all. And just, it just becomes like, again, like someone asked on a Q&A this week about, you know, what, how, why, do you, why would you still train if you've maxed out your potential? Now, whether this guy's maxed out is oh, yeah, another, yeah. another thing. But it's, like, it's just for the other reasons. It's mental health, it's mindset, it's performance, it's, it's, it's energy, it's, it's everything else that you just, you can't imagine life without it. So... I think tuning into more of the reasons why training is valuable is, is, is important. But yeah, I think there's a lot of different things that we've probably discussed as to what people need to understand where they want to be on that spectrum and what they're willing to, to commit to making the best out of that um, spectrum as well. I think though, just going back to the, the recombinant or gain and deciding whether that's right for you or not. Online, there's a lot of debate over it and there seems to be almost two camps have developed, whether it's the the bulk and then mini cuts or is this the slower kind of recomping and gain training approach and i think the it's not that at least in my opinion that one side's right or wrong but it's just that context is being mixed missed because i think if you want to build as much muscle as possible in the short amount of time which is what bodybuilders are trying to do because they compete each year and then they you know build or whatever to before then then next prep then i think embracing the fluff pushing body weight up bulking whatever you want to call it and then doing mini cut or a prep is going to be the most effective way to do that. But if you're not a bodybuilder, you're not doing all these things optimally, like, like we've said, building muscle isn't the highest priority in your life, then potentially to get the main, the recomping can be a good option. And I think yeah. where people often say, oh, recomping only works for beginners. I personally don't think that's true. But I also think if we actually look at what constitutes a beginner, most people view it as just years in the gym. But if you look at most people in the gym, that I don't believe is what I'd consider a beginner because a training age, I don't think it should be chronological because most people have had a, 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 a gym membership for maybe 10 years, maybe trained on and off for 10 years. If you go and train with them, their form and effort is terrible and they look, they would still be, in my opinion, a beginner. And, you know, like I'd, I'd fall into the same category. I think everyone thinks they train harder than they do. Everyone thinks their form is probably a little better than it is. So I'm, I'm not exempt from that, but it's just, if it only works in beginners, well, if you've been training like a pussy for 10 years, the truth is the first time you get Akash takes you for his, uh, to his gym and takes you on the hack squat and does that double drop set and all of that, that's going to be a new level that you've never gone to before. That's a new experience for your, bot, for, for your quads. They're going to be getting a new, you know, those newbie gains or whatever it is. So there's loads of people in that beginner phase just because they've been training for years who could benefit from this recombin or slower approach just because you had a gym membership for 10 years doesn't change that. Well, I can safely say, Ed, you do trade very hard. So yeah. <laughs> I, I remember we were watching him and uh, we were just like, 
I swear the set's about to end. And then another rep comes, another rep comes, big breath at the top. The vein gets even, the vein on his forehead gets even bigger. <laughs> if you think it's, it's bigger another, than the podcast, wait, yeah, wait. It's another rep out. Gym, yeah. <laughs> and it's not even just on a hack it's on an RDL. I'm like, how do you squeeze reps out on an RDL? For me, it's like, once you're near failure on that, you're done, right? But he's like <laughs> pushing that one past failure. It's like, whilst keeping good form as well. So yeah, very impressive to see. Very impressive. Um, I think a final point on, whilst we're talking about embracing the fluff, is another topic, uh, another question I'm getting a lot about is cardio and the use of cardio in um, hypertrophy muscle building phases because there is the old adage of, you know, if you, if you're, you know, when you're, when you're trying to build muscle, if you, you know, don't run, walk, if you don't walk, sit, whatever the thing is, to basically be as lazy as possible yeah. so you can build as much muscle as possible. But I think there's a lot of benefit to incorporating some level of cardio just to stay fit because if you don't have any sort of cardio in your in your weeks, it can be very easy to just lose that cardiovascular fitness, and and you just you, that actually imp, I I find it impacts your training to an extent. You don't. It's not always obvious, but especially that leg training. If you're not fit, you actually limit your growth potential because you don't get those reps towards the end because your fitness may be giving up. You know, let's say you're doing like 15, 20 reps on the leg press. There is a massive cardiovascular element to that. If you're gassed after doing eight reps, you're go it's going to find it very difficult to, to squeeze out more and more reps. So I think there's a lot of benefit to doing cardio. That doesn't mean you need to overly do it where you're doing, say, six sessions a week. But there's a lot of benefit to having a few sessions where your heart rate, go you, you've got your heart rate up, whether it's steady state or like five, 10 minutes of, of HIIT. There's, there is some benefit in making sure that you are staying cardiovascularly fit throughout the year. Um, and, and it's an impact on training and just general day-to-day -day life. So if you are going yeah, through well, a phase, even if it's embracing the fluff, don't just think that means no cardio, no steps, no activity. You've got to keep all that up. Yeah, well, I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier. With uh, We need to look at the, the lifespan and we need to look at what's going to be optimal, not just from a muscle building perspective, but from overall health, cognition, all that stuff. And we, we know cardiovascular work not only is going to Yes, cardiovascular work in the context of hypertrophy, I think when implemented correctly and when the modality is suitable, I think it can be a fantastic addition to, yeah, as you mentioned, getting your cardiovascular fitness up, meaning that you can recover from your sessions a lot quicker too. Cardio between sessions has been shown to also improve recovery if, if done properly too. And, and yeah, the, the last thing you want is your cardiovascular system to be the limiting factor within your training sessions, you know? So I think when implemented appropriately, in a, in a, with an intensity that you can recover from and do a couple of times per week, I think it's going to have no, no negative impacts on your hypertrophy, especially if you're eating enough and especially if you're spacing those cardio sessions adequately throughout the week. Away, I would say as far away from your leg training as possible. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's a hindrance to your muscle building effects or muscle building potential like it used to be or people used to think anyway. A few things I did for years that I don't know how optimal it is, but it, it, it did allow me to get the cardio in quite, quite easily is I tack on like 10 minutes of, of hit, um, you know, at the end of a, at the end of a leg session, but just making sure that the last exercise on the legs isn't like, you know, my legs aren't completely non-functional um, or like directly the day after. And even though the legs would be quite sore, I just found it helped recovery, just getting blood flow in there. And that way you're then, you then get another few days before you have to hit legs again. Just another way to, to sort of um, add it in without impeding on recovery, because most probably is most cardio is leg based, isn't it? It's um, it's generally sort of leg based. I need to doing something like the cross trainer, uh, but yeah, even that still quite like you still still a lot of legs, right? And I don't like, think it needs to be a lot. That's the thing. You don't need to do a lot to to maintain cardio, but if you do none, it will dissipate quite quickly. It's one of those things that cardiovascular fitness goes really quickly, doesn't it? And so. Yeah, I think if, you, if you're hitting a step target every day and potentially if you're having to go out for a walk for that to, to at least get some of it, one to two, then the steady state sessions across the week. Yeah. As long as you're also then training hard, like leg training hard and like all training really, but especially leg training is going to provide you cardiovascular benefits as well. Like if you're going to death on a leg press, like you're going to be out of breath. So that's going to provide you that. I would then just supplement it with just some lower intensity, steady stuff. Um and like you say, I really like it actually. I find it works well from a practical point of view the day after legs. Um, just because if you are training them twice a week, it just means it's the longest time till you hit them again. And I think 
if you wake up really sore legs, if you go on the spin bike or cross train or something like that, you, they do feel a little bit better afterwards for sure. Mm. So the bottom line is uh, if you've got into the shape of your life, you've, you've always got that choice of what you're going to do next. In general, the rule of thumb is anywhere between zero and 2% of body weight per month. And the reason why I say zero is because that's perfectly fine as well. If you literally want to stay the same body weight each, each month, that's completely fine. Choose wisely though, between that, that bracket and uh, understand the implications and consequences of, of where you are on that spectrum. For most people between zero and 0.5% is probably where they want to be. Um, if you are have got serious muscle building ambitions and you've got to a point where you are lean, then pushing the envelope a little bit further playing a long game approach is is obviously going to be better for maximal muscle mass any closing thoughts do your cardio too <laughs>